And I really consider Pastor Mike a missionary evangelist. And uh, as he goes to these different nations and, and hear the reports of people that uh, just getting touched. And you can be a part of that, and your heavenly reward can be extended as you give this morning. So, Father, we just ask that you would touch your people to give to missions, to this missionary. As he goes, he sacrifices his family, his time, uh, 20-something hours in a plane, so many hours of traveling by bus or by, by car. And he goes to these remote, remote places that nobody goes to. And, Father, we pray for mighty revival. We pray for your spirit to lead and guide him. Give them the words to speak, Father, that they are ignited by faith. Ignited by faith. And as he speaks the word of faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and salvation will be brought forth. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless this time and this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, you're going to go around. Yes? If you write a check, write it out to For His Glory. If you're going to write a check out, write out to For His Glory. And, uh, well, wait a minute, hold on. Before you do that, just write it out to Mike Kelly. That's okay. We'll, 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 we'll keep it. <laughs> we'll, we'll reimburse him. You went around already? Oh, you went that way? She forgot past the top. Hey, what about me? I know, that's mama. I want my blessing too, you know. Amen. Well, Pastor Tom, would you take that... If there's a check that's there for for his glory, just uh, give it to me, and then uh, we'll we'll take care of that this afternoon. But all of the all of the rest of it, just bundle it up together and give it to Pastor Mike at the end of service. And I got an envelope for you too, brother, over here. Not that you preach for for the money. I know you don't. But um, Amen. Okay, Sunday school is dismissed. Look at all these little. Tiny people. That's Mike Kelly, K E L L Y. So good to have Brother Bob Lewis with us again. Amen. 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 After service, we're going to pray for him, too. God will touch him. Amen. Well, you all know who, who this person is down front. We don't need any, any introductions with him. So um, we just, we're just thankful. And I just want to say this. Um, Dottie, thank you for allowing your husband to go to these places. You know, I believe you're an important part of his life. I believe that as you are sitting back and praying, that is the reason why the uh, power of the anointing is on him. You know, the Bible says, can two walk together except they be in agreement? And, uh, you know, sometimes I know in marriages it's not, it's not easy, it's tough sometimes, but uh, God will have his way. Amen? So thank you for your blessing. Thank you for holding down the fort, so to say, as he goes. And Dominic, you too, okay? You can help Grandma as much as you can. So without further ado, Pastor Mike, would you please come and bless us this morning with God's word? Come on, give him a good God hey, bless you. Hey. God bless you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh boy, that was awful. Are you all awake this morning? Praise the Lord. No, no, no. Praise the Lord. I mean, say it like you really mean it. And please tell your face that you really mean it. <laughs> Praise God! Yeah, that's right. Hallelujah. God bless Brother Kemp. Wherever, wherever he may be right now, he's probably in glory, man. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 
It's so good to be able to be together with you again. We are so excited, and we are on the countdown. Uh, we are leaving tomorrow in the afternoon. Well, actually, I'm flying in the afternoon, so probably leaving sometime in the morning. Lord knows. Um, but God is doing amazing, amazing things. We give him glory. We praise his name. We just came from uh, Tennessee, time in wonderful, wonderful. I was wrecked in Tennessee. Man, God, anybody ever been wrecked by God? <laughs> it, we, we just encountered him then in such a powerful way, and he met us. And I was wrecked before I went, but as we went, man, we, we experienced his his power, his glory, and we were blessed beyond measure. Words can't e are, are not e enough. I don't even have words to describe what we experienced, what we felt, everything that happened there. It was truly, truly wonderful. And it was a work of the Spirit in preparing us. That was the first leg of this trip. Uh, and we were really, really connected in the spirit with our brothers and with our sisters there. But something very significant happened. Well, actually, three days before I went to Tennessee, God did some miraculous things uh, in me, to me, <laughs> birthing some stuff and breaking some stuff. Hallelujah. Bless his name. And uh, just bringing us into real encounter, face-to-face -face encounter with him. And I'll explain a little more as we go along what, what I mean by that. Um, God is an amazing God, and he wants the best for us. And he poured out upon us, man, we, more than we could ever imagine, more than we could ever comprehend, more than our finite uh, human minds, even have the ability to ascertain God. To say that God met us is a great understatement. The, one of the last nights I was there, the last time that I, I was there about two years ago before we went on another trip, and um, this brother, Mike Wise, who, who is there in Tennessee, great, wonderful brother, 15 years ago, uh, the very first missions trip I ever took, um, by myself, I had gone with other people and, and been a part of, an, of other ministries and gone. But the very first missions trip that I ever, when, when God called me and, and I ever went by myself from, from here, uh, I went to Brazil and I met my brother there. He was an American missionary who was working there and living there at the time, teaching English and involved in a, in a ministry there. And uh, so he traveled with me and took me everywhere that I went and uh, he translated everything for me. <laughs> I mean, everything, every conversation, everything. And it, was, and it was wonderful. And we connected in a powerful way. And so we've always, we've been connected since then. And he is very much a part of our ministry. And he knows our heart. Because God birthed it all together with him as we walked together there in Brazil uh, that very first time. Uh, but this past time, there was a brother that I knew of uh, that I didn't get to meet. I didn't get to, to uh, have time with him, fellowship with him, and I desired to meet him and, and to spend some time with him. I knew of him. I had heard about him. I know some people who know him very well, but I didn't get an opportunity the last time I was there to fellowship with him. And when... Just about our time was, was finished in Tennessee. I was feeling a little down because I'm saying, oh, man, another time that I, that I missed an opportunity to be with this brother. He was just, like, so busy and everything. Well, this brother, he stayed up for two days so that he could come. And uh, the two days before I left, at night he came, and he just was able to be together with us. We shared meal together and pray together. And this brother is a... Is a um, was a Sudanese refugee. He's from originally born in Sudan, 
uh, was from there, but, but during that uprising and, and the genocide that took place, he lost most of his family. And uh, as, a, as a young man, really a, a teenager, uh, he fled for his life into Uganda and grew up in the very area where I'm going now, in Uganda and Kenya. He was in Uganda living and did schooling and went to college in, in uh, Mumasa in Kenya uh, at the college there, which is very close to where I'm going to be in Bangoma. In fact, uh, two days ago, I got word from, from another brother, uh, a bishop who is there, who was in Pakistan, who has come back, and he will be together with us there in Kenya. Uh, they want us to do service in Mumasa at, at the very place at, at this brother's college. And so I was very excited when they said, <clears throat> they're having an open air meeting there, crusade. One night, <laughs> the very last night before we, we returned back to Uganda, um, but I was able to finally come into communion and fellowship with this brother. And, and uh, he's a wonderful man of God and a powerful, he's really an apostle. He has just, just a, a heart for souls and lives and, and, and just, just wants to do the plan. I mean, just wants to walk in the plan and purpose of God. And he is so excited about what God is doing. Well, he prayed for us, my wife, myself, my brother down there, and uh, he anointed us with oil. And he said, in fact, he, he anointed my feet, he anointed my hands, he anointed my head. And I said, brother, just pour it all over me. <laughs> you know, I, I just want all that God has. And it was wonderful. This brother, oh my gosh, man, when he, when he prayed something, you know, there are some people who just connect in the spirit. And this brother, man, when... It was divine. It was a divine appointment. And it was very significant that this was the time that we would be together just before I, I, I go and because I'm going to the very place where he grew up and where, where he, uh, where actually God revealed himself to him. And, uh, and so it was very significant. And we were blessed, just blessed beyond measure. And so I praise God and I thank God for that. Uh, but God has been speaking into my spirit, revealing some powerful things to me. Um, and like I said before, man, I'm being wrecked. I am I, I, completely. God is changing me, completely revamping me. Uh, I, I, am, I am surrendering to the will, being broken by God again and again and again. And God is revealing powerful things. And, and this message that I'm going to bring this morning, I pray that God would give you ears to hear and a heart that is willing to obey. God began to show this to me some time ago. And... Last night, in the middle of the night, I wasn't going to preach this. I was going to preach another message. But God spoke to me by the power of his spirit, and, and he kind of changed my direction very late last night, actually about 3 o'clock this morning. And uh, so we're going to go into this place. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. And for those of you who know anything about Matthew chapter 24, it is Jesus, one of his Olivet Discourses, and he's talking in particular about, hallelujah, praise God, about the coming of the age. He was asked a question, well, what will be the sign of your coming? What, what will take place just before you come back? What will be the, the end of the age and, and the signs of your coming? And this is the passage of Scripture, Matthew 24, verse, beginning in verse 42. You have it right up there. Beginning in verse 42 through verse 51. Hallelujah. Bless his holy name. Praise his holy name. So we praise and thank God this morning. But God is quickening his word to us. And things are quickly hastening to the time of the end. And we must be ready 
for his coming. But the church is not ready. And many in the church are unclothed. They're not dressed. They're not walking before him. In fact, many don't know him. Even though they sit in church, even though they be members of a social group that may have the name Church on the Door, yet they really aren't surrendered completely to the will of God. They haven't learned yet how to die. And that is really, when we come to Christ, that is what we do. We come to die. We must be broken. We must be empty of everything that we are when we come to him and we give our lives. We are surrendering our all to him and saying, Lord, be Lord of every area of my life. We sang today, Jesus, be the center of it all. No, Jesus, be all in all. My all in all. Paul said, look, in you I live, I move, I have my being. I don't even exist apart from you. Your life is flowing in and through me. It's not that we just, we pray a prayer, we say something, these magical words, and then, oh, we just add Jesus to, uh, to be a part of our life. No, that is not the gospel. But that's what the experience of many is today in the church. They think that because they prayed a prayer somewhere, someday, and said this music, these magical, oh, Jesus, come into my heart, and nobody even has a clue as to what that really means, and that's not even scriptural. Jesus never asked anybody, pray this prayer, repeat after me, come into my heart, Jesus. Do you want to come after me? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow me. And there is a spirit that grips, that, that, that grips this age. It's a spirit of worldliness. And it's a spirit of stupor and a spirit of drunkenness that pervades the church. Oh, we know that the world is not saved. We know that they are under the power of the Antichrist. We know that the spirit of lawlessness and wickedness rules and reigns on the earth. Prince of the power of the air. He's very much in control. But the sad fact is that the Laodiceans are very much in control of what we call the church. And whether or not we realize it, there is a spirit, a powerful spirit, that is a worldly, fleshly, demonic, occultic spirit that has taken hold over the church. The buck, Isaiah calls it a spirit of stupor. And so that's what I'm going to call it. Because that's what God says in his word it is. And Jesus talks about it in this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 24. He said, so you too, you got to keep watch. For you don't know what day or what time your Lord is coming. I'm coming soon, he's saying. And you must be ready. Stay awake, he says. And understand this. He said, listen, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming or when a thief was coming, he'd keep watch and he wouldn't permit his house to be broken into. That's the New Living Translation. I'm reading here in the, in the, the English, the English Standard Version. It's very similar to that, though. But we don't even realize, there it is, <laughs> <coughs> We don't even realize that something has already crept in. And all, something has already 
come into the house and is already stealing the goods and already wreaking havoc. And many are in bondage. Many have been tied up. And, and we are so blind today in the church because we, we are consumed with so many other things other than the truth that we can't even see our own predicament and the peril of our way. And we don't even know that an enemy has come in and that many sit in churches and they are bound. Therefore, you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't think or you don't expect Him. Continue, please. Hallelujah. Who then is faithful and wise? whom his master has set over his household to give them their food or their nourishment or to feed them at their proper time. There's another passage of Scripture that I want to take you to before that and I Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Can we go there? Uh, <clears throat> Hallelujah. Bless his name. Don't lay up for yourselves, he says, treasures on the earth. This is very contrary to what we hear in the church today. And the message that's being preached in the church today, because today it's all about Money, it's all about prosperity, it's all about materialism, it's all about vanity, it's all about natural beauty and all of the rest. These are spirits that have crept into the church and have taken hold of the people of God and especially the ministers of God, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, the self-proclaimed prophets. But this is the word of God. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where must where moth and rust destroys, and where thieves break in and steal. But he said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. In other words, he's talking about eternal things. Things that are priceless. Things that don't have a monetary value here on the earth. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there your heart is going to be also. And that's the question that I want to pose to you today. Wherein lies your treasure? What do you hold most dear? I was reminded as I was looking in these passages of Scripture of that passage of Scripture in Mark 16 where Jesus, or Matthew 16, I think it is, where Jesus is having uh, discourse with his, with his disciples and, and he's saying, look, I know what the word on the street is. You tell me. What are they saying about me? Who am I to them? And, you know, they give the, the, the answer. You know, some say you're, you're Jeremiah, come back from the dead. Some say you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist had just recently, you know, his life was taken from him. And many say because, you, you know, you're preaching about the kingdom of heaven. You're always talking about kingdom of heaven is like this, that maybe you're John the Baptist. Or because you cry over Jerusalem and weep for them. Maybe, maybe you're Jeremiah. Maybe you're the weeping prophet. Or one of the other prophets that has come back. Or maybe because of the miracles you do and, the, and, and, and how you, 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 know, you walk on the water and you calm the sea and you, and you raise the dead and you heal the sick and you do all of these things. Maybe they think you're Elijah. Maybe, maybe one of the prophets, somebody. And then Jesus says, well, but who am I to you? Never mind what everybody else thinks. No matter what, what everybody else does because they have their own mindset, their own thing. They think I'm somebody else. That I'm standing right here in front of them and they don't even know who I am. And during that discourse, you know, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're there and they're, and they're trying to test him. And they're coming not because they are desirous to sit at his feet to learn from him. No, they want to trip him up. And they come to test him, to try him. Not seeking after him.
And Jesus said, well, let me tell you something. Follow it. Let's show righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. See, they think they had the precepts of God. They think that they could come, you know, oh, you know, we are children of Abraham, Jesus. Oh, you are. Well, if you were, then you would know who I am. If you were really and truly children of Abraham, and if your hearts were, were broken in his, and you knew that word, then you would know who I am. But you haven't even got a clue. I'm standing right in front of you. You're supposed to know this word. You're supposed to see the promises. You're supposed to know the time. And I'm standing right in front of your face, and you can't even see me. You don't even know it's me. I'm the fulfillment of all those scriptures that you gave yourself to. And you don't even know that it's me. You can't even see. You don't have eyes to see, ears to hear. You're blind. And Jesus said, well, who am I to you? Who am I to you? Do you know who I am? And that's the question that he's posing to us in the church today. Do you even know who I am? And he goes on in, in Matthew 24. Go back to Matthew 24. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. <clears throat> and he's going to reveal something powerful to them in this passage of Scripture. Stay awake, for you don't know what day, or the time, for that matter, what, what, when your Lord is coming. And continue. 43. But know this, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, would not let his house be broken into. Continue. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at proper time? In other words, there's a watchman that he has, he has appointed who is supposed to watch. He set him over the affairs of the house. Just for that reason, so nobody will break in and steal. No one can come in and corrupt. No one can come in and, and lay hold of anything in the house. Because this one is supposed to be awake. He's supposed to be ready. He's supposed to be prepared. His heart is supposed to be diligent. His eyes are supposed to be fixed. And yet, this one doesn't even know that already there's an enemy in the house. He's already wreaking havoc. He's already... He's got so... All, already, those in the house are already tied. They're already under bondage. He doesn't know it, and they don't know it. He's supposed to be giving them food. He's supposed to be feeding them. He's supposed to be teaching them. He's supposed to be pouring out on them. Keep going. Blessed is that servant whom, it, who, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Who's watching. Who's waiting. Who's feeding. And giving. And nurturing. And caring for the members of the house. Keep going. Truly I say to you, he'll set him over all of his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master has delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servant, and he eats and drinks with drunkens. Now, Stay right there for one minute and turn over there, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. And I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. 
this word. When it says in this passage of Scripture, to smite or to beat on, this is what it actually means. This is the very same word that is used. Thus sinning against your brothers and your sisters, you know, because brothers is brothers and sisters, right? Sinning against your brothers and sisters, wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. What is he saying? You water down the word. You make it of no effect. You don't preach truth because you don't know truth yourself. You don't walk in it. You haven't experienced it. You haven't really encountered him. It's like the blind leading the blind. So preaching this watered down pablum crap that you call the gospel that isn't the gospel at all, but it's a fallacy. You're wounding them. You're wounding their con consciences. The more that you talk, the more that you preach, the more untruth you feed to them, they believe it's true. And you're wounding them. And who's going to be held accountable? If you don't preach truth, and cause a multitude to fall into hell, to end up in hell, because you didn't preach truth. Because Jesus said, listen, my followers, they know. They hear my words. They follow after me. Another they're not going to listen to. Truly, if you follow after me, my servants, are those who obey my word. They hear my commands, and they follow after me. And they give themselves to me, and I give them to know the truth. And the truth will set them free and make them free. But if you continually preach lies, and you continually preach untruths, and you call it truth, And you beat them with a false gospel and a false narrative. No power, no authority. You don't preach judgment, but just something that tickles the ear. Doctrines of devils. You don't even realize there are demonic forces at work behind the scene that you are playing right into. Yes, all of those who are preaching this. Easy grace. All you got to do is say these words you're in and then go live like you want to live because I'm saved. I'm saved, but I can still drink. I can still smoke. I can do here. You're not saved. Saved from what? Saved from what? Save from sin, to fall into sin, to stay in sin, to be bound and end up in hell. That's what you save from. And that's what you save to. Jesus warned them. He said, look, y'all looking for the second coming. I wouldn't be so quick if I were you. Because it's all going to happen and you're going to find out at the very end. You're going to come and stand before me, and he's going to say, look, I don't even know you. Because I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. Oh, yeah, you thought you were. You gave me you. But you can't save anybody. You can't deliver anybody. And that's what's happening in the church. We all, all we have is a bunch of flesh. And no flesh will glory in the presence of God. Because flesh can't save flesh. Hello, if we could, we wouldn't need Jesus. If we could save ourselves, he wouldn't have had to come. Only righteous blood. Only the life of Christ flowing in and through us will cause us to live righteously. 
flesh begets flesh. Only by the Spirit can you mortify the deeds of the flesh. You live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the flesh, put to death the deeds of our bodies. In other words, lay yourself on the altar and break in the presence of God. Allow Him to break you. Allow Him to wreck you. And encounter the living Christ. Trouble is, we have created Christ out of our own vain imagination. And these men preach a Christ that they have created. But He's not the risen Christ. He looks like them, talks like them, acts like them, puts up with what they put up with, lives like they do. But he's not the eternal Son of Almighty God. Amos chapter 8 is powerful. In fact, if you really want to get wrecked, do a study on the book of Amos. And you'll find out he speaks more about our day than any other. And about our time. And you would be very, very surprised at some of the things that he speaks about. He talks about the idolatry that takes hold in the last day. And the spirits that are operating in the last day. Behold, the days are coming. This was way back when he prophesied. Declares the Lord God, when I will send. Who's going to send? I will send. Ooh. I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, natural bread, or a thirst for water, natural water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. God said, I will send them strong delusion so that they believe those lies. Because they do not love the truth. That is the indictment of God against this day, against this age. And verse 12. They shall wander from sea to sea. From north to east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. But they will not find it. The New English uh, translation says they'll, be seek, they'll seek after revelation, but they will not. They will not come to revelation now. Their hearts have been given over to lies. And because they don't love the truth, Romans 1, man, although they knew God, they knew God. Who's he talking to? They once knew God. They didn't worship him as God, sovereign Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. See, it's not just, oh, I'll make Jesus my Savior. No, he, is, he must be Lord of all or not at all. Either he is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He doesn't take second place to anybody or anything. He is not content to be a part of your life. Even your aspirations, and many of us, even in Ministry, especially, we have come to expect certain things. 
And we have this spirit that we think we entitled today in the church. And entitlement is nothing more than expectation that's been corrupted. Because God didn't come when we thought he should, or when he didn't come the way we thought he would, or he didn't do what we had in our mind and in our heart. See, I thought when he called me that it would be like this, or I would be doing that, or... You know, I expected when I started to preach that the throngs would come and the multitudes would come and many would come and line the altars and give themselves. But Jesus, that didn't happen. And so my expectation became corrupted and I got a chip on my shoulder. And that spirit is very alive in many today in the church, and that's the spirit of the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They don't walk in communion and intimacy. And that's what Jesus wants more than anything else. He's not concerned whether or not we have great ministry. He's more concerned with your intimacy and communion with him and whether or not you're broken in his presence. Because he knows if you go out in your own strength, you're going to fall flat on your face. And you're going to get discouraged and perplexed and hurt and beaten up and wounded and the enemy will have a heyday. And nobody will get saved. Oh, you may sound great. You may look good. You may have the best orchestra out there. You know, like we, we think all this atmosphere is what draws it. Oh, we got to be like the world so we can draw them. That's why we have professionals, you know, now in the pulpit. Professional singers, professional worshipers, professional people who play professional instruments, professional preachers who preach nothing but garbage. They play to the masses. You don't want, you don't want commitment? All right. You don't want a harsh word? All right, I'll just tell you what you want to hear. And the, thing, and the thing about God is he'll give you just that. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Did you know that passage of scripture? Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires of your heart? He knows better than you know what the desires of your heart is. And if he knows that you're, you're, you really just want the world, you just really want people to love you, and you just really want the best of this life, God will say, okay, I'll give that to you. And I'll make you think that you're serving me. That's the delusion. Because you don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. Therefore, you come up empty. You're not filled. Only the heart that hungers and thirsts after him will be filled by him. Only as you empty yourself can you be filled by him. Only as you die, you will ever experience the power of resurrection. You've got to die. You got to die in order to, to live. That's what God is calling us to. That was, is what God is leading us to. That's what God is desiring to do in and through us. In the spirit of drunkenness that He talked about in Matthew chapter 24. Is a spirit, when you're drunk, man, you can't tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Your judgment is clouded. Your vision is impaired. You can't think straight. You can't walk straight. You can't even speak right. Because you're under the influence of something that has control over you, and it's not God. So that what you're producing and what's coming out of you is a foreign entity. And that spirit and anointing you're passing on to everybody all around you. So that now it's not just your judgment is clouded, theirs is also. You don't walk straight and neither do they. You don't talk right and neither do they. 
You don't live right, and neither do they. You're operating under that spirit. It's a contagious spirit. And God will give you over to that because your hearts are not willing to broken. But a call goes out in this day, in this time. God is looking for people who haven't bowed their knee to everybody else to be like everybody else. The eyes of the Lord, the scripture tells us, is seeking to and fro throughout all of the earth, going throughout all of the earth, looking for men, looking for a woman who'll give themselves to him, who will come and die to the I am that's in them and surrender themselves to the great I am, give themselves to the only one who can truly set them free. And only as they die to themselves, die to their own desires, die to their own aspirations, die, 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 can they ever come into new life. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? You come to Christ, you put to death the desires of the flesh. You die to the things of this world. My desires, I lay at his feet. Paul said this, look, we had to give ourselves as living sacrifices. Go over to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. There's an offering that God demands, and God desires, and he's looking for an offering. Hallelujah. Malachi chapter 3. When you have it, say amen. Hallelujah. Behold, I send my messenger, and he'll prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This is the day. This is the time. The spirit of anointing of Elijah is coming and being poured out right now on the church. God is raising up sons and daughters from all over the earth who give themselves completely to him, withholding nothing. He's calling them out of obscurity. Didn't come from worldwide missions or, or worldwide ministry. Came out from all that other stuff. And on the backside of a desert, God called them. He raised them up by his own hand. And we're walking under that anointing. God called me to be a son of the covenant. And that's why I go. Verse 2. Keep going, brother. Or sister. Sister. <laughs> That's a sister back there. Hallelujah. No, no. Malachi 3. Whoop, 3. <laughs> 3. And verse 2. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Bless his name. <clears throat> Malachi. Hallelujah. But who can endure? the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears because he's like refiner's fire and full of soap. He's talking about the word that he preaches. Because God is looking for an offering. Keep going. God is looking for an offering. He'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he'll purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And how are they refined? In the fire. In the fire of God. God calls us to the threshing floor where we're broken before him. Where we lay down, we lay down everything. And he breaks us and crushes us and wrecks us. So that there's nothing left of us. Because there's something inside that needs to come forth. 
And it was birthed there by Him. And He's drawing that out of us. But the trouble is, we've got all this stuff that attaches to our lives. All this, what they call alloys. You know? All this stuff that isn't good. Doesn't look like Him. It binds us. Keeps us from being everything He would have us to be. But it needs to be broken off of us. And there's only one place that that happens. And that's in the refiner's fire. And as the Word comes, the Spirit of God quickens into our spirit that Word that purifies, that sanctifies. And He calls us. The Spirit calls us. The Lord Himself calls us to that place where we can be refined by Him in the refiner's fire. And then He says, then, then and only then, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former years. You go down. He's talking about the offering that we give. And if you read this entire passage of Scripture, everybody likes to quote from the last part, I think, was it, is it verse 8 or whatever where it talks about, you know, the tithes and the offering. Oh yeah, will a man rob God? Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, verse 8, hello. Well, a man robbed God, yet you're robbing me. But you say, well, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and in your offerings. Hmm. You are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me. God said, you bring to me what la was lame, was halt. But you see, we are supposed to be the offerer. So then what are we offering to God? We are supposed to give ourselves. We are supposed to lay our lives down, remember? It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So you got to lay down. you got to die. you got to be broken in the presence of God so that God's presence, God's anointing, God's life can flow in and through you. Only then will you be able to walk in the promise and anointing of God. You can't walk in the power of the Holy Ghost in flesh. Can't please God in the flesh. No flesh will glory in the presence of God. You need to walk in the Spirit. Got to be filled with the Spirit. So you rob me. Because you don't give me what's mine. But he says, yet I have the tenth. Boy, if you, if you, if you really look at the prophets and that, they talk about the remnant only the remnant is going to be saved and the tithe because the tithe belongs to the Lord. The tithe belongs to the Lord and there's a remnant who have not bowed their knee, who have not given themselves, but they have laid down and ceased to exist. They're resting in the hope of the one who called them from darkness into his marvelous light. The one who changed them, who raised them, who anointed them with his own presence. He is calling them, those burning ones, who because they've been in the fire, they burn with passion and desire for him. You can tell a true worshiper of God Hello, hello. You can tell a true worshiper of God than somebody who's just sitting on the sideline taking up space. Because worship isn't just something we do in church. And the Father is seeking after those who give themselves to Him, who worship Him in spirit and in truth. But see, they live in it. They don't just visit there once in a while. They live in it. It's part of who they are. It's in their spiritual DNA. I'm a worshiper before I am anything. Before I am anything, before I can do anything, I'm a worshiper. I'm a worshiper. I'm broken at his feet. I would rather be at the feet of Jesus than anywhere else. And I was praying before I went 
to Tennessee three days before the Spirit of God began to speak to me and move me, and I've been in that place, broken in the presence of God. <clears throat> and sometimes, you know, I used to think, well, yeah, I did that once. Yeah, well, according to Paul, you've got to live there. It ain't just somewhere you visit <laughs> every once in a while. No, every day he said, I die. i got to die every day. Every day you've got to reckon yourself as dead. Every day lay down at the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 And God reveals himself in that place to you like never before. And I was crying out in the presence of God. Crying out for the presence of God. Lord, I want to know you in that way. You know, I've been reading Philippians and some dangerous scriptures. <clears throat> you know, and actually praying those things. And God say, oh, you really want to know me in that way? <clears throat> And I said, Lord, you know I desire you. And I was crying and, and, and worshiping God and weeping. And I was taking, I was praying with my brother in Africa. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> my brother in Africa faded. Oh, he was there online. And, and, but I was somewhere else. I was not there anymore in my house. All of a sudden, in the spirit. I didn't say I flew through the roof and all that. No. In the spirit, I was not there anymore. I was before the presence of the Lord, and I saw the sword, the flaming sword. It was a, it was, it was you're going to think I'm crazy, but let me tell you something. I saw it, and that fire was, the color of that fire, colors of the earth don't, don't come near to that. I saw through it. It was transparent. And the, but the color, my God, the red and the and their bits of blue and all of that and the yellow, my Lord, if if that's what the, it was, I don't even know if that's what they call it, but it was a. There's, there there aren't words can't even describe, but I saw the flaming sword and I saw somebody behind the sword whose whose eyes I saw was the 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 outline of a man. And I saw behind the flaming sword and, and I saw the eyes of the one. Who, who looked at me through that sword and, and those, his eyes were flames of fire that drew me to him. I, I, yeah, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't even help. I, I was just drawn in. Drawn in before him. And, and, and I went through and, I, and the flame and I felt, man, the eyes of the Lord. You talk about the eyes of the Lord. Everything is exposed in the presence of God. And he saw me, I mean, hello. And I was there, and, and I expected in the natural, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to see him, and, and I'm going to see him. And, and, and before I knew it, I was just drawn into him. And he was in me. And I realized, he's in me. I'm in him. He's already a part of the life of Christ. He was showing me, look, you're already. I'm in you. You're in me. My presence, my what you've desired, I've given to you. And that flame burns inside you. That sword is alive inside of you. And I was in that place. And, and I came back, and you asked my wife, the whole house knew. Because it was, I don't even know what time it was, but for two hours, I, I went, I took the oil, I prayed over everybody, I prayed over the entire house, I prayed over every window, every door, every wall, I think every inch. <clears throat> and I, I woke them all up, I prayed over them, I anointed everybody with it. You asked Dominic, his mother, Aaron, everybody, the whole house knew my brother, my brother Hector, I went in there and I, man, I'm telling you. And my brother... <laughs> My brother, I forgot all about my brother in Africa. He was hanging on the line, but he heard me, and he called some brothers there. And it was early in the morning, and he ran out, and he called the, a bishop who lives not far from him. You got to come here. You got to hook into this. You got to hear this. And they were all, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even know what was going on over there, because, man, I was already, <clears throat> and God broke me. I mean, God revealed himself to me, powerfully to me. And I was changed. And I was changed, quickened by his power. And, and I couldn't help myself. 
I mean, I was in the presence of, of God. And then for those three days before we went, even on the plane, I'm crying. It was like, oh, Jesus. The, the fountain just kept going, kept going, kept going. And I cried and I cried. And then when I got to Tennessee and I'm preaching the word, I cried again. <laughs> you know? But God did an amazing thing. And I want to read to you something that God spoke into my spirit and revealed to me. And this will be the, the, I just want to share with you some of what God spoke to me before, before I went to Africa this past time. The last time I went, before I went into Tanzania. <clears throat> and he quickened the word into my spirit and everything that, that he's been pouring into me, he revealed to me beforehand. And this was a word I was, I was meditating on the word, you know, because I journal. And if you don't do it, you, you should do it. You really should, because God will speak to you. Many times in the middle of the night, you'll wake up from dreams and visions and pray. Pray like that. God, give me dream. When I wake, when I lay my head on this pillow, give me visions in the middle of the night. Let your word come to me. You ask my wife sometime, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up in the middle of the night speaking in tongues. Because the Spirit is working. Spirit is moving. God is revealing things even as I'm sleeping. And my mind is unfruitful, but my spirit never sleeps. It's alive and connected. Connected to God. Hallelujah. So I was meditating on the word, and it was the book of Habakkuk. Because I love that guy. You know, I was here the last time and told you. And I want to be called. I want God to call me that. I want your name to be. He could change my name. I, I want, he clings to me. <laughs> That's what I want, man. Yeah, call me that, Jesus. Look, I, he's the one that clings to me. Looking expectantly into the perfect law of liberty, watching upon the watchtower where God had, had called me to, waiting to see what he's going to say, waiting to see what he's going to say when he speaks to me. And how I, I'll answer him when I am reproved. How can I endure the word that will come and speak to me? Will I be able to convey the message as he reveals it to me? Can I write it openly, even because I'm reading, you know, the prophet, write it, make it plain upon the tablet. How can I, am I going to be able to really write and explain what he speaks to me? Will I understand really? And I pose a question to the Lord. Lord, reveal to me, is this the time that this word speaks about? Is there an appointed time? Is there an appointed season? Are you about to come and do something? You're going to reveal yourself powerfully because you said it would be in the last day. Are we, is this the day? Is this the time? Are we in the season? Are we coming into the glorious liberty of the sons of God that your word speaks about in Romans? Will your glory really be revealed in us like Haggai the prophet? All of this I was posing before the Lord. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, I brought you to this very place. And I'm making you over new. Listen intently and you'll hear. Be attentive and you will see. For my glory will be revealed. And I'm coming to my temple. Vessels of honor. That is what I desire. Gold and silver. These are what my heart longs for. Wood, hay, and stubble. The chaff shall be completely consumed. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I have spoken to you. Now walk before me and be thou perfect. Be mature. Come up to the work of my hands, God said. Come up to the call. Come up and receive from me. Get out of the muck. Get out of the mire and purge yourself. Wash yourself with pure water. Did not I tell you if a man would cleanse himself from these he would be a vessel of honor fit for my use. Yes, this is the time. It is the season. For I am about to cast my sickle and I am about to reap my harvest. The fruit withers on the vine. The earth cries out in distress and all of creation is in fact groaning. How long, O oh Lord? I cannot delay any longer. I must send forth the laborers. I am calling them. I must reap the harvest for time is drawing near. Have not I told you to come up higher? I'm calling you to a higher place in me. Put on your priestly garments and walk before me as my very own. Have not I spoken to you? Have not I revealed my word? And yet you do not really understand. 
I know that you are flesh. I know your weaknesses and your frailties even better than you know. I will quicken you and make you every whit whole. When you proclaim my word, then you shall be whole. As you speak, your spirit will soar. And the weakness of your flesh and of your body will be diminished. I will lead you and direct your path. I will place my word within you and I will quicken your natural body. Do you understand? Now wash yourself and purge yourself. Prepare yourself for I'm about to reveal myself to you. That which you have longed for. After that which you yourself have sought, I will indeed confirm my word to you. I will pour, pour out pure water on those who are thirsty. Remember what I spoke to you? The vision is yet for an appointed time. And at the time of the end, it will speak and it will not lie. And I again went to Habakkuk chapter 2 because, because I, I remembered, you know, and I, and I looked and I wanted to make sure I was hearing this from God himself. <clears throat> and God was speaking to me, and he said, write the vision, make it plain upon the tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. That's what the scripture says. And at the time of the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will surely come. And God said, this is the appointed time. For I'm coming to visit wrath upon the nations and upon the sons of disobedience. The earth cries out in violence, and the wickedness rises before me. Many who call themselves by my name have polluted themselves. They wear garments of death. They have traded the garments that I gave to them for filth and for shame. They follow after the dictates and the things of this world. They no longer desire me. My word is no longer in them. The desire for truth has escaped them. They don't love my truth. One who speaks lies has enticed them, and they have followed after him. The entire world will for a short time, and only for a short time, be led astray. But I am in control. I am casting in my sickle, and I will reap. Do you understand? It is now the appointed time, for their wickedness has come to fruition. But my glory shall be revealed. For I am coming to my temple. Suddenly I will come. And I will fill this temple with my glory. The treasure of the nations, yes, the desire of the nations, what is longed for and hoped for shall come. My glory will bring the revealing. My word does not return unto me void, but it will always accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. I am fulfilling my word. You will see and you will know I have called you by my name. You are mine. And I will show myself plainly and clearly to you, even as you have desired. Walk before me as my very own. Remember what I told you. Your identity is found in me. I am your father, and you are my son. Walk, therefore, like my son. Walk even as your father. For I have called you to be like me. Pattern yourself after me. Seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, saith the Lord. For I am your father and you shall be my sons and my daughters saith the Lord God is quickening us his word is true and we must come and fall at his feet and be broken in his presence, that he can raise us as that army that he's calling forth, those ones. For the harvest is truly plenteous, 
and laborers are few. God is calling us into the harvest. But we can't go in our own strength, in our own power, under our own capability. We must be broken, emptied of all that we are so that God can fill us with everything that He is. His life, His anointing breaks the yoke. His power sets people free. His truth breaks the chains and calls out of darkness. Hallelujah. God is calling. God is calling. Tell all the people. Never in nation. Nation that he reigns. Believe the word of God. I want you to stand to your feet. Zion is calling me to a higher place. Let's sing it together. Zion is calling me. The word is calling me. The spirit is calling me to a higher place of praise. Calling me to empty myself of all that I am. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice and praise. He's calling us. Desiring us. Even more than you desire. He desires you.